Okay, so this is the Stoke Juice year number five, I think. Um, and uh, once again, I changed our plans. Um, I was going to start off by reviewing what we did last time, uh, but I kind of uh, feel like that would be starting off on the wrong foot. So I want to um, start something fresh. Okay, so if there's more to say on last time, feel free to um, uh, to bring it up to me, uh, I guess, uh, in one of my groups or a private message and we can continue talking about it. So preface here. So today's entry is the first time that Marcus Aurelius mentions God, okay? And um, I have, uh, I guess, a, a preface and then a preface to the preface. The preface to the preface is that, and I, I say this throughout the Stoju podcast um, from time to time, but um, I attempt to do something that I'm not sure if it is a legitimate move. And what that is, is to get what I can from Stoic ethics without delving into stoic um physics and metaphysics okay so i think i mentioned in in the the first session of this year in the summer that you know you have the stoics held that you had to study ethics about how to live but also physics you know what the physical universe is made up of and metaphysics i don't know if they differentiate between, between the two and then logic so needless to say their view of physics and metaphysics is not going to correspond to what we hold about physics in the modern era and their view of metaphysics is definitely not going to correspond to Judaism's view of metaphysics. So what I attempt to do is to, you know, understand as much as I can about what their premises are in order to be able to understand their ethics and then adapt their teachings as much as possible in line with our premises. And this is why I say, I'm not sure if this is a legitimate move. I mean, uh, you know, if you studied, uh, all right, random example, if you study Christianity and you heard them talk about Jesus, you can't just swap in Hashem for Jesus because Jesus is a completely different God, you know? So same thing here. Uh, I, I don't want to pretend that we're going to just like swap in Hashem for the Stoic view of God, but there is an overlap. And I what I want to try to do is to keep our eye on our view of God, note where they differ, and then try to see, you know, to what extent can we gain useful ideas in stoic ethics and decision making by you know by examining their ideas about their god in light of our ideas about hashem okay if that makes sense um so i'm going to read to you here three intros on what the stoic view of god is just so we can have some frame of reference because again marcus really wrote this for himself he's not going to explain this to us um and uh, i again this is not an area of my expertise i'm relying on what i'm finding online so first excerpt is from wikipedia in uh, the article on Stoic physics, okay? So Wikipedia says, I think this is the second paragraph of the article, to the Stoics, the cosmos, the universe, is a single pantheistic God. Pantheism is the belief that everything is God, one which is rational and creative and which is the basis of everything which exists. Nothing incorporeal exists, okay? So in other words, their conception of God is a physical God, okay? Because they hold that God is synonymous with universe. Um, the nature of the world is one of unceasing change driven by the active part of reason, logo, uh, uh, sorry, the active part or reason, logos of God, which pervades all things. The active substance of the world is characterized as a breath or a pneuma, which provides form and motion to matter and is the origin of the elements, life and human rationality. The cosmos proceeds from an original state in utmost heat and in the cooling and separation that occurs, all things appear which are only different stages in the change of primitive being. Eventually, though, the world will be reabsorbed into the primary substance to be consumed in a general conflagration, uh, ekpyrosis, out of which a new cycle begins again. Okay, so you can see right away it's already messy. Okay, so we've got um, uh, we've got a, a couple points that are different from Judaism. Number one, we do not believe. Well, let, let me put it this way. I do not believe in a pantheistic God, okay? I, I think that there are some subscribers to certain strands of Kabbalah and Hasidus who, if you actually prod their beliefs, you realize that they believe that everything is God, okay? Uh, I don't think that that is a Jewish idea, um, but you'll find Jews who say it. Um, we also uh, differ with the Stoics in the fact that our God is incorporeal, is not physical, and their God is corporeal, is physical, because he's synonymous with the universe. Um, they deny creation, right? They hold that there is a, um, uh, like a cyclical, um, uh, you know, coming to existence of the universe and going back. I don't know if, uh, well, it sounds like they, they do hold it cyclical and it'll begin again. Whereas we hold, you know, creation. In the creation of the universe out of nothing. 
uh, they hold that the universe is characterized by rationality, um, which we'll see in, in, in the next couple of excerpts here. And so do we. We hold that, you know, the, the first pair of Breshis uses the analogy of malacha uh, to describe God's relation, you know, the universe in relation to God as the creator. And mal what is malacha? Malacha is uh, design imposed on matter. Uh, so design meaning structure and lawfulness and intentionality and rationality. So that part is a, a point that we have in common. Um, at least on the surface. And uh, what else do we have in common here? Oh, also, you know, we also would agree that the the, the nature of the world is one of, uh, of, of change, okay, that the world is constantly undergoing change, which we'll talk about. Okay, so hold this in mind. Let's read another, uh, another uh, excerpt here. So this is from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy in the Stoicism article, uh, section 2.7, God. In accord, in accord with their ontology, ontology is the study of existence or being, the Stoics make God a corporeal entity, a physical entity, identical with the active principle. God is further characterized as eternal reason, logos, or intelligent designing fire or breath, pneuma, which structures matter in accordance with its plan. The Stoic God is thus imminent uh, throughout the cosmos, meaning it pervades the cosmos and directs its development down to the smallest detail. The entire cosmos is a living thing, and God stands to the cosmos as an animal's life force stands to the animal's body, enlivening, moving, and directing it by its presence throughout. The designing fire is likened to sperm or seed, which contains the first principles or directions of all the things which will subsequently develop. This makes cosmic nature and all its parts inherently governed by a rational force. So I guess what we would substitute here instead of saying sperm or seed, we would say DNA, right? DNA is, is, is we use the term, you know, code, right? Genetic code, which contains the program, which will determine how life unfolds. So that's what they hold uh, that God is doing and everything. God and divine actions are not like God of Greek mythology, random and unpredictable. we got to remember here that the Greek gods were capricious. They did things arbitrarily. They were moved by emotion. Okay. It is rather orderly, rational, and providential. The association of God with pneuma, with breath, may have its origins in medical theories of the Hellenistic period um, on the issue of God and its relation to the cosmos and stoicism. See essays. Okay, fine. Okay, and then we have one more excerpt, which is a, the, the closest thing I could find to a one-sentence definition of God from Seneca. And this is actually quoted in, uh, do I have the book here? Um, there's a book that, uh, oh, here, I got it here. Hold on. Um, okay, let me, uh, yeah, you can see this, right? Yeah. Elevator Pitches for God. Uh, this is a book. It's 71 page essays by thought leaders on why they believe. Volume one. Uh, this book was brought to my attention because our very own Rabbi Dr. Ellie Fader and uh, Rabbi Aaron Zimmer and Rabbi Hillel Wolf uh, are, uh, have entries in this book. So I forgot who said this, uh, but there was a, a scientist who quoted this definition from Seneca. What is God? The mind of the universe. Okay. Which means the organizing force of rationality in the universe okay so again our goal is not to go into this in depth but having some background about what marcus aurelius means i think is, is good for us um i guess let me pause before we start reading today's entry any just questions or comments on uh uh on what we just read okay i'll take that as a no um okay one more point here which is i ordinarily do not mess with the translations that I use here. Like I don't edit them, but I have seen a trend in um, different Stoic translations that basically in the Stoic writings, you'll find that they use the terms God, gods, and Zeus interchangeably. Okay. Meaning that in the same translation by the same author, they'll just switch back and forth between God, gods, and Zeus. Now Zeus and God, you can understand because Zeus was the God that was you know the head of the pantheon in uh greek society where stoicism started um so zeus and god makes sense but why would they swap out god singular with god's plural again i don't know this for sure but my my sense is that you know the stoics were emerging in a polytheistic culture and they did often try to like you know they were speaking to their audiences not marcus really obviously but they were speaking to their audiences and so they would refer to they were referring to their belief in god but they would just basically let me put the let me stop for one second if you are an orthodox jew and you're talking with a uh a, a non-jew or someone who's a not religious jew and you're talking about god you're going to say the word god and you're going to very well know that they probably don't have in mind what you have in mind when you say god you know but you continue the conversation anyway 
Um, and if if a particular point comes up, then you clarify it. So my impression is that that's what they were doing with their audiences, is that they would say, God, God's Zeus, and they would have their own stoic idea of God in mind, but people will swap in you know, these other terms, and they were much looser with them when talking with these audiences or writing for these audiences. So what I did was I swapped out all the terms God's with a lowercase g and an s with god capital g and s because i feel like even though the stoic god is not the same as our god i think it's closer to the notion of gods plural or zeus so that's the only change i made in these translations okay ready to begin or have you got any questions or concerns okay just a bunch of blank screens okay all right let's let's start okay so as we usually do we're going to read all three translations yeah isaiah wait sorry did i miss you said you went once correct. And you translated all the gods into God or God into gods? Uh, I took all of the instances of the word gods, plural, and I made them singular with a capital. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So here we go. We're going to do what we usually do is we're going to read the three translations that um, that of uh, this uh, chapter in a row, and then we will ask questions. Okay. Translation one from George Long. All that is from God is full of providence. That... Uh, again, we, we will use the term hashgacha, okay, because that's the Hebrew term that we use for providence. That which is from fortune is not separated from nature or without an interweaving and involution with the things which are ordered by providence. Okay, you can tell this is the 1862 translation. From thence, all things flow, and there is besides necessity, um, and that which is for the advantage of the whole universe, of which thou art a part. Okay, it'll get clear when we do the other translations. Um, uh, but that is good for every part of nature, which the nature of the whole brings, and what serves to maintain this nature. Now, the universe is preserved as by the changes of the elements, so by the changes of things compounded of the elements. Let these principles be enough for thee. Let them always be fixed opinions. But cast away the thirst after books, that thou mayest not die murmuring, but cheerfully, truly, and from the heart, thy heart thankful to God. Okay, next. Hopefully this will be more understandable. The work of God is full of providence. The work of fortune is not divorced from nature or the spinning and winding of the threads ordained by providence. All flows from that other world. And there is besides necessity and the well-being of the whole universe, whereof you are a part. Now, to every part of nature that is good, which the nature of the whole brings and which preserves that nature. And the whole world is preserved as much by the changes of the compound bodies as by the changes of the elements which compose those bodies. Let this be sufficient for you. These be continually your doctrines, but put away your thirst for books so that you may not die murmuring, but truly reconciled and grateful from your heart to your God, uh, from your heart to God. Okay. And then the last most modern translation, Waterfield, oops, that's supposed to be God's works are filled with providence. The works of fortune aren't independent of nature or of the interlacing and intertwining of things under the direction of providence. It is the source of everything, including necessity and the well-being of the universe, the whole of which you are a part. What is good for every part of nature is what is supplied by the nature of the whole and what preserves the whole. And what preserves the whole is the changing of the compounds no less than the changing of the physical elements. Be content with these doctrines. Make them your constant guiding principles. Get over your thirst for books so that you don't die grumbling, but with true serenity and with heartfelt gratitude to God. Okay, so let me do what I usually do is I'm going to copy and paste all the translations into the chat uh, so you can have them there. And then we will focus on the screen on the most uh, modern translation, and then we'll ask our questions. Um, also, just note regarding the last line, I mean, we're, we're going to ask questions, I'm sure, on the last line, but remember that uh, the previous entry had a similar thing about, uh, you know, don't, uh, don't like, go crying after your books, because remember, he was on a battle campaign, so he didn't have his books with him. Okay, Isaiah. Okay, so kind of don't know how I feel about this passage, and not because of the matter any like metaphysical claims making, yeah. but because of I think what I think the practical advice that it's giving is. Okay. Which is like why is it why would it be good to not try to get clarity about these ideas? It sounds like it's saying like learn learn these the content of these doctrines and let that be good and then like live ah, your life okay. and don't like think about it more. Okay. So your 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 so your questions on the last two uh, sentences, right? So yeah. So the question is, what is he, um, what is he saying at the end? It seems like he's saying that you should just, uh, you should uh, just be content with these general doctrines, but not seek more knowledge 
and clarity. Um, but shouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I guess to, to, to distill this into questions for our purposes, what is his view and do we agree with it? Yeah, because it seems like Judaism is in favor of seeking knowledge of God and how he uh, runs the world, right? Or understanding your beliefs in general. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, Rachel? Um, yeah, well, first of all, just with that one, I remember last time he said something also about throwing away books. I don't remember yeah. what it was, but I yeah, was actually wondering... let's let's just quickly look at it. Um just to compare it. Um oh, is this number four? Yeah, this is number four, not number three. Or not number five. I said number five. Okay. So in uh number uh in chapter two, yeah, he said um Oh yeah, forget your books and don't let it upset you. That's not allowed, right? Yeah, so that is interesting there because that is kind of a pure aside. Whereas uh, I think Isaiah is picking up on the fact that here, um, it does seem to be a little bit more connected with the previous statement, and then he connects it also to so that you don't die grumbling, but with true sincerity and heartfelt gratitude to God. Yeah, what were you gonna say though? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. They seem different. Um, just what he means by like what is providence? What is fortune and yeah the significance of their it seems like he's trying to say they're interconnected in some way yeah okay good of that is okay what is providence what is fortune and then what is their interrelationship yeah okay good um i also want to add here uh to isaiah's question um and why does he give the reason of so that you don't die grumbling um but with true sincere uh, ser you know serenity uh etc um how does being thirsty for books result in dying grumbling and without serenity serenity etc I'm putting this as part of this question because I think I think this is all part of one argument about his books. Yeah. Okay. What else? Yeah, Tamar. Um, I, I, we probably won't be able to answer this for a while, but like, what's the Havamina or the baseline that he's good? I was actually that was that was a question I was hoping uh, <laughs> I was going to ask that if no one asked that. So what is the hava amina? Meaning, what um, what false belief uh, is uh, you know I guess uh, intellectual or psychological um, is he attempting to uproot with each of these statements? Uh, particularly, well, I guess each of these statements. Yeah, I guess that's. Um, uh, meaning that's going to go on, you know, God's works are filled with providence. So is the half mean that they're not filled with providence? The works of fortune aren't independent of nature or the interlacing and intertwining of things under the direction of providence. So the half mean is that they are independent of nature, right? That fortune and providence don't have this relationship. It is the source of everything, including necessity and the well-being of the universe, uh, the whole of which you are part. So what's the half mean there? Is it that providence is not the source of everything? Um, is it that you are, you know, somehow not a whole, a part of this whole? Uh, what is good for every part of nature is what is supplied by the nature of the whole and what preserves the whole and what preserves the whole is the changing of the compound. Yeah. So each of these statements has Havamina's uh, and I, I'll add just as a, um, uh, oh, sorry, attempting to uproot. I'm just going to add here. Um, oh, I have one more question. Um, I'll say where, where do these Hava Aminas uh, stem from? Is each one, its own, you know, uh, you know, based, I guess it's each one, it's its own assumption or do they share a, uh, common root? Yeah. Rachel. First, can you just remind me what Havamina is? Yeah. Havamina is a false belief, uh, that the statement comes to uproot. So for example, if I say, if I just, you know, I don't know if, if, if uh, if you, you, if you go home and your mom says, we are having dinner tonight then you'd be like, why would I think otherwise? You know? Uh, yeah, right. Like, so the Havamina of that statement is there will not, we're not having dinner tonight. And that's why he has to say there is dinner. So, so it's like the, the reverse, uh, I mean, it's not going to be straight the reverse, but it's going to be, 
the false premise that he is coming to up to to refute by stating this statement. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Um, and then also, it seems like he's trying to create some sort of relationship between like the individual parts and the universe as a whole in yeah. terms of like what's considered good or beneficial. Okay. That's good also. So uh, how should we <laughs> formulate this question? Let's go with um, what is his view of good and its relationship with the, the universe as a whole and in its parts that I think casts a net over the entire thing here, but particularly this statement here, what is good for the, every part of nature is what is supplied by nature of the whole and what preserves the whole and what preserves the whole is the changing of the continents, no less than the change of the physical elements. Yeah. I think related to Tamara's question, we have to ask, um, uh, what, is the flow of i guess what is what is his what is his main idea and how do each of these um arguments uh you know contribute to that main idea uh what is the flow yeah isaiah do we ask like what does it mean to have a constant guiding principle sorry do you say what, what does it mean to have providence as the guiding principle no, well, what does it mean to have a constant guiding principle? Oh, to have a constant guiding principle. Uh, yeah, where is he? Oh, here, yeah. Yeah, right, right. We did not. Um, so, yeah, let's see here. What is he saying that as soon as he should be content with these general prime? Yeah, uh, yeah, we'll put that as a separate question here. Um, okay, what does it mean to have these, to, I guess, to be content with these doctrines and make them your constant guiding principles uh how does one do this practically yeah isaiah i guess i kind of want to expand my original question like um how, how can you do that make them your guiding principles if you don't if you're not like compelled to like understand exactly what they mean okay and how can you do this if you're not seeking uh, more particular knowledge of what these principles mean. Yeah. Okay, I feel like, yeah, Tamar? It's a little bit of a meta question, but I know you were talking about this before, but like, is there, is there an ethical takeaway from this or is this just- Oh, right. Um, yeah. Uh, Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna tack that onto my question here, which is, um, uh, actually no, I'm gonna no no I'm actually gonna make that its own, its own question. What is is you know, what if any is the ethical, practical, decision making takeaway here? Yeah. Um, I think there's one part which we didn't have. Oh yeah, I want to ask here, um, <laughs> and this is uh this is something I'm always searching for uh which is uh what role does gratitude play in the writings of the stoics and i kind of missed this reference here um so i'm gonna ask what is his conception of gratitude uh which is acknowledged at the very end All right especially if if the um uh if these entries on the stoic view of god are true this is not a god who is personal you know um, so what kind of gratitude can you have? And I think, uh, um, I forgot tomorrow, if you and SD and I and Isaiah, uh, talked about this in, in our, uh, our mindfulness chat, but, um, but, you know, you see atheists, um, talk about gratitude. And I always kind of wonder, like, what does that mean for an atheist? Exactly. And again, I'm not saying he's an atheist, but like, you know, for, uh, someone who does not believe in a personal God, you know, and I'm not denying that there, that there is such a notion. I, I just want to know what it is. Like if he holds that, like, you know, he essentially, again, he holds, seems to hold that, that the universe is synonymous with God. So like, is he really like thanking nature? I mean, what is, what exactly does that, does that mean? Okay. I feel like we got the main questions here. This one was a little bit more, uh, um, <laughs> manageable than the last one. Okay, so let me let me post these into the chat, and I could always add questions later. 
Uh, okay, so we've got, oh, this is already too much. Okay, so let's go one through four. I also, I don't know if you guys feel this way, but I feel like there's already potential for like some unity in this uh, idea. Oh, it, it fit here. Okay, so let's just wait, change the numbers. Five, six, seven, and eight. Okay, so let's think about this. Uh, and you know, I'm gonna go ahead and repost the uh, translation in case someone didn't get it before. Uh, let's think about this for a while. And then what we'll do is have, um, uh, you know, ideas, uh, answers, or, or takeaways. Yeah, tomorrow you have a question or you have an idea? I have a question. Sure. I, I know you addressed this, I'm just like thinking about it again. Can you restate like um, what we're hoping to get out of this? Because let's say it's based on false metaphysics and it's just like, we would say this is like an error, right? Then, then right. what would we do? How would we figure that out? Right, so I, I'd say that, you know, errors are not something that, uh, are like a single error does not necessarily invalidate an entire uh, idea. You know, like again, talking about mindfulness again, you know, there's a lot of uh, mindfulness teachers out there who have a lot of valuable stuff to say. And a lot of it is based on, uh, you know, a worldview that we don't necessarily share, but, um, you know, there's still useful stuff you can extract from it. And yeah, it's possible that, that something that is useful is entirely based on a false assumption, in which case we couldn't be able to use it. But I think it's always worth asking, um, you know, what the uh, what the use is. And in fact, I, I just want to state here. Let me see if I can find the Gemara really quickly. Um, this is a statement that um, that I have in mind a lot of times when uh, if if I get into discussions about learning Stoicism or, or uh, some other non Jewish philosophy. Um, Hold on, maybe. Uh... I think it's a Gemara and Megillah. Um, evidently, I'm not finding it. Oh, okay. Well, it's in Echa Raba 2.30. I think it's also a Gemara, but it says, um, Im yomar lecha adam yesh chachma begoim tamin. If a person tells you there is chachma in the non-Jewish nations, believe them. Hadahu Dixiv, this is what it's written in Ovadia uh one eight, Bahavarti Chachami me Edom Utvuna Mehar Esav. Uh Hashem says in his prophecy to Edom, I will destroy uh or cause Chachami to perish from Edom, uh, which according to Chazal is Rome, and understanding from the mountain of Esav. Yesh Torah Bugoim, but if they tell you that there's Torah among the nations, all time, then don't believe them. Uh Dixiv, as it says, Malka Visareha Vagoim in Torah. Uh that it says, uh, her king and her officers among the nations, no Torah. Um so, you know, Tor uh, how exactly you define Chachma and Torah uh, is a good question here. But um, the mistake, I think, is, well, this is not just about Stoicism. I think this is a mistake when people uh, go into any sort of non-Jewish philosophies, is if you're trying to approach this as if it were Torah, like that this is a complete system that's going to have everything that you, that, you, uh, that you need and that is designed for man, so then obviously... There's only one such system that was given, and that was from Hashem. There's no Torah among the Goyim. But if they said that there's Chachma among the Goyim, there is Chachma. And I assume that when Chazal say that, they know that you're going to have to engage in this kind of like disentangling. Like you're going to have to say, well, you know, what is it about Aristotle's works that are, um, you know, that we can uh, benefit from? And uh, and where in lie fatal errors that like you can't even touch those ideas because they're all tainted by these errors? And then what areas are, you know, are will we have to like tweak and adjust? So, for example, you know, I, I didn't go into this because it's not really uh, relevant to our worldview right now. But uh, in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, when it says that, where did it say it? Um, oh yeah, the active substance of the world is characterized as a breath or pneuma, which provides form and motion to matter, and is the origin of the elements, life, and human rationality. Well, you know what the what the uh, Rishonim believed is the um, I, I don't know if you call it the proximate cause, but the the cause of of form in matter, including the elements and the cause of human rationality, they hold that that is what Aristotle calls the active intellect and what Chazal call Metatron, okay, um, uh, or the Sar Ha'olam. It's one of the angels, okay, and so that idea apparently is a an idea that was floating around in Greek and Roman philosophy that the Stoics. 
ascribe that to God himself because they hold that God is a part of the universe, whereas we don't say that that is God. We say that's one of the angels that God created. You know, so like, I guess that's another answer I'm having to your question tomorrow, which is that in addition to like trying to disentangle this and get what we can, this can also help us to better understand what Chazal meant when they were writing about this stuff, you know, because this was the world that they lived in. Um, uh, you know, uh, in fact, Marcus Aurelius, you know, again, was at the time of the Tanaim. So when you see Tanaim writing about similar concepts, I mean, this is th this was this was the cutting edge philosophy and science that they were dealing with here. So that's an, a secondary value. But the primary value is just to get whatever we can that's useful. And um, and, uh, you know, and that is going to involve some sort of like disentangling. Uh, I hope I answered your question. Yeah. All right. Okay, so anyone have any ideas here? Either answers to our questions in particular or just uh, overarching theories about the main idea? I mean, I think Rachel's questions are primary. We have to define what providence is and what fortune is and what the interrelationship is. And I think using the Havmina, let, let's actually, let's focus just on, um, on this first statement here, okay? God's works are filled with providence. Actually, let's go down to this translation. Um, so God's works are filled with providence. The works of fortune aren't independent of nature or of the interlacing and intertwining of things under the direction of providence. Okay. So, um, why, what do you think the Havmin is? Why does he have to say that? Or what would the competing false viewpoint be? Yeah, Tamar? I don't know if this is the one that he's opposing, but it's a one, um, which is that I think people sort of make a difference between the way things happen in their life and the way and like the systems that are out there. So like, you know, you stub your toe and it feels like a personal insult, that right. type of thing. Yeah. Right? I think is, is a is a false distinction that people naturally make. Okay. All right. I think that 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 is definitely a candidate here. Yeah, I would say actually now I'm thinking I think the word fortune was making me think of more like like big things actually. I gave examples of stubbing your toe, but like if you lose your job or something or right. you know, something that feels like it's it's about the story of your life, but if you're not thinking about it in the context of, of nature or um, I don't know exactly what he means by profit. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's a good example as well. So I think if you just take the statement, let's just take it very simply. Okay. Even without getting to that level of particularity. So the, uh, I'm going to actually type this out here. Okay. So, so the Hava, oops, sorry. The Hava Amina um, of of you know statement number one sorry statement number one is god's works or i guess i'll just say the universe yeah let's say the universe the universe is not filled with providence and uh there are works of fortune which are independent of nature and not intertwined with providence okay and what i get out of that is i.e um there is such a thing as chance um, that governs events, okay? And uh, the, the uh, you know, what Marcus really is saying is, uh, I, you know, I guess idea number one is, nope, there is, there is no such thing as chance. Um, everything is providence. Okay. And when I say chance, I don't, I, I think chance could be in several ways. It could be like randomness or it could be like tomorrow was saying, like taking things personally as if it is not stemming from some sort of rational system. Uh, and maybe in those days it would be like, you know, the gods are out to get me, you know, uh, which is not a thing that is like providential in the sense that was described earlier. Okay. So this is idea number one, I think. And I think idea number two flows from this. Okay, let, let's just look at number two. It is the source of everything, including necessity and well-being of the universe, the whole of which you are a part. Okay, so I think this, again, this flows directly. So Hava Amina of, of statement number two. So statement number two is, um, is everything, so again, everything um, is from providence. Um, and, uh, in, including, what was it, including necessity and the well-being of the universe. Um, yeah, I guess the question is, what's the difference between this idea and the first one? But I, I do think that, th that it's, you know, the, the Havamina here is that 
there are things in the universe, you know, such as necessity and well-being, which do not stem from providence. Okay, and the uh, the answer is uh, everything stems from providence. Now, again, I don't know exactly what the the uh, the difference is between you know why he has to make these into two separate statements, but let's just let's just think about it from that framework. Uh, and you could disagree with me, by the way. I mean, this is just the way I'm looking at it right now. Like, what what would it mean to have a world where there is no providence? You know. Like in in terms of the 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 qualities he's drawing our attention to. In fact, you know what I'm going to do. I, I didn't actually plan to do this, but um, let's just read it in the Rambam here. Okay. Um, I don't know if this is going to help us, but I'm just going to read from the Mordebuchim. Uh, yeah, Isaiah. Um, this might be unconnected a little bit, but maybe it would mean that like a thing can happen to you that bad just. For no reason, and like right, other than just it's chance, it right, just happens to you. And so this will definitely that, affect the, the way that you view the events in your life. Yeah, that's definitely the case. Okay, let me just read here in um in uh this is the morning book in three seventeen. I'm using the Goodman translation. Uh, he says the views people hold about providence are five. All of them ancient, heard in the time of the prophets when the true Torah appeared and shed its light where there was so much darkness. And I'm not going to read all five. I'm just going to read the the one that he is refuting here. First comes the view of those who deny providence altogether over anything. Everything in this world, in the heavens or elsewhere, occurs by chance and the disposition of things with no ruler, oversight, or care for anything. Uh, this is the view of Epicurus. Um, and Epicurus was a the the you know the leader of the Epicureans and the Sto I, I don't know the nature of the dispute, but I know that the that Stoics uh, Stoicism and Epicureanism were two competing worldviews at the time. Um, oh, who was also an atomist, uh, A-T-O-M-I-S-T, like a believer in atoms. Atoms, he held, mingle randomly, and what results is also random. Uh, this was the view of the Israelite deniers, too, of whom it is said in Jeremiah 5.12, they gave the Lord the lie and said, it is not he. Um, Aristotle confuted this view, proving it impossible for all to depend on chance. There must be a ruler who orders things, a point I've touched on already. So from what I've seen... Um, then uh you know these people held that like everything really is um just randomness and uh things that you perceive as order are really just either illusory or they're not true order there's no actual design there okay which there are people today who hold that you know as as uh you know as 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 you know under under the guise of, of uh, science but um yeah so that seems to be what he's speaking against here but see, I'm I'm trying to highlight methodology here. That let me uh, pause for one second and just take a step back here. So one big question is how does how should uh, we understand the first chapter of Brachis? Okay, um, which describes the creation. Okay, and there you know there was a time when the Mafarshim who were commenting on Brachis assumed that it was teaching ideas in physics. Okay, and there are people now who hold that like Gerard Schroeder. But um, or Ger Gerald Schroeder, um, but uh, you know, I I think that's a that's a stretch. So I wrote this uh, article. Let's see if it's on my new. How I teach Masa Brachis. Um and what I do, I got this approach from Leon Cast, who is a um a secular. Uh, he wrote a book on philosophy called uh, sorry on on Brachis called The Beginning of Wisdom, Reading Genesis, where he writes a commentary on all of Sefer Brachis, uh, which is what he calls a wisdom-seeking approach, where he tries to learn, you know, what what can we get from this book if we assume that it is written intentionally to teach us wisdom? And what he does is he basically shows how in the first paragraph of Brachis, the Torah was uh, engaging in a polemic against competing worldviews um, of, of the creation. And so what I do, what I used to do in, uh, let's say if I have this here. Um, yeah, I used to go to this site. Let's see if it's still up. Yeah, okay, so this the site called bigmyth.com, and it's got uh, all of these countries here. And what you could do is you could click on a country, and it'll give you a flash animation of the creation story according to that country, okay? And so what I would do is I would show this to all my students, and we would look at a whole sampling of them. And you would see that, like, 
the way that the Torah, you know, the Torah is talking to everybody. So we're, the Torah is not talking to philosophers and scientists, it's talking to everybody. And this is the way that you're going to view the world growing up as a Jew, you know, reading Gracious. So what, what Cass shows is that the Torah is narrating the creation in a way where if you grew up with the Torah's narration, you're going to view the world in certain ways. Whereas if you grew up with a different culture's, trans, you know, uh, creation story, then you're going to view reality and make decisions in a completely different way. So in this article I wrote, I, I gave examples. So for example, um, you know, scientific account of creation versus magical. I wrote other religions, creation stories are mythological and fantastical. Many of them involve a multiplicity of divine beings. For example, spirits, angels, demons, demigods, supernatural objects with my mystical properties and magical generative processes. In contrast, Masa Breshis is scientific in its character. It describes an orderly creation process involving things we see in the world around us. No otherworldly beings or supernatural things, just early phenomena that we observe around us every day. Even the actions of the creator are not described in miraculous terms. It is easy to see how this orientation towards the world lends itself to a value system which promotes scientific inquiry rather than imaginative mythos and primitive superstition. I'll read one more just for sam sampling purposes. Um, universe as divinity versus universe as creation. Other religions maintain that the universe itself is divine or has divine qualities. The Torah makes it clear that the entire universe is a creation. This rules out the possibility of worshiping the universe or parts of the universe, such as the sun, moon, and stars and planets, as gods or having godly qualities. It can be argued that this is the essential difference between a primitive outlook and a scientific one. So long as a society perceives nature as a panoply, panoply, panoply of divinities, each with its own independent will that must be appeased, the gates of scientific inquiry will be barred and concealed. So I write like a, you know, a bunch of uh, reasons like this. And so... That's kind of what uh, I'm inclined to, uh, how I'm inclined to approach this uh, passage in Marcus Aurelius is if you are seeing the world as a world governed by rationality, by providence, by God, you know, in the Stoic view being God is the mind of the universe, that the universe operates according to rationality. Uh, versus if you're viewing it as operating based on, on on chance and randomness, and there is some providence and other areas are not governed by providence, how is that going to affect the way you see the world and your place in it and what happens and what decisions you make? That's like the methodology here. Yeah, Raquel, sorry, I, I saw your hand, but I didn't, uh, I wanted to finish this point. No, no, you, you, you answered my question. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think one thing that's very clear is if you view the universe as being governed by rationality, then you will seek, first of all, you will, how are you going to make decisions? You're going to make decisions based on the rational part of yourself, because the rational part of yourself is the only part of you that can discern and align itself with the universe, you know, and this is very in line with what we said before in, in, uh, you know, in the past about how it seems like the, the part of the Stoics view of good is, is living in line with nature, you know, so let me actually just write this out a little bit, which is, um, uh, you know, if you view the universe as, as being governed entirely by providence, i.e., you know, uh, rationality, um, then you will make your own rationality into the prime mover, uh, the prime mover, that's two words, because it is the only part of you that can discern and align, uh, you know, your, your entire being with, with, uh, with nature. Okay. But if you view the universe as part providence and part something else, you know, or wholly governed by chance, then A, there's no guarantee that, you know, devoting your life to rationality is going to pay off. Um, B, there's not necessarily any system that can you know, uh, increase your odds of success, um, however you define that. And C, you may need to tap into some other part of you or some other force to increase your odds of success, right? So for example, like, you know, tapping into some form of mysticism or imagination or raw animality. I mean, I, I, again, I don't know if this, uh, I don't know how this premise uh, 
affected the Epicureans, but you know, Epicurean uh, philosophy was that that every you know the highest good is pleasure, and they acknowledge that the mind can provide a higher pleasure than the body, but ultimately everything boils down to pleasure. So like at the end of the day, you know, pleasure is going to win out in their philosophy, and whatever gives you pleasure is going to is going to be what you should seek. You know, like in terms of like what your life revolves around. So where does that leave justice and righteousness and like? you know, uh, uh, aligning yourself with your, with your, with your mind and working together with other humans. Like it does not seem to bode well for that. Um, so that th this, you know, I, there's radically different uh, practical implications of, of these two competing worldviews. That's like the way I'm pre perceiving this right now. Okay. Are we good with those first two clauses? Should we move on? And we can always go back. Okay, so next, what is good for every part of nature is what is supplied by the nature of the whole and what preserves the whole. Okay, uh, and what preserves the whole is the changing of compounds no less than the changing of the physical element. Okay, so let's break that into two, two statements here. Okay, so what is good for every part of nature is what is supplied by the nature of the whole and what preserves the whole. Okay, so what is he, uh, what is he saying? What is he speaking against here? You, you could start with either one. Maybe he's speaking against like saying that the good for something come from that thing itself rather it comes from like the creator of everything. Okay. So that's, that, that flows well from what he said before, which is the providence. Oh, sorry. So the good for you can come from other sources. Okay. Uh, I think that's one half Mina. And the reputation of that here is that, um, your good comes from providence. Okay, that's that's part of it. Yeah, what else? Yeah, tomorrow. Maybe also it's another how you know be like a zero sum approach. Can you spell that out a little bit more? Like, what's good for this part is necessarily necessarily to the advantage of the other part. Okay, right. Um, okay. Yeah, go ahead. I don't have much. I mean, I could give maybe examples, but I yeah, sure. Give me an example. I think it'd be better to work with. Um, well, I think people people are like this in society sometimes. Yeah. You know, like what the way that I can get ahead in my job is by putting down other people and getting ahead of them. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, um, so, um, the there, I'm gonna say there, it, it, it's. It's a zero sum game in which there is not necessarily enough good to go around for everyone. And what he's saying is, no, Providence provides enough good for everyone. And um, what is, uh, you know, and, and I guess there, 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 there is a common good. And again, I'm not getting this exclusively from this chapter. We saw this, especially in the first chapter, there's common good that uh that i guess seeking the common good will be beneficial for you and for the whole um meaning uh in other words you don't have to compromise your own good um for the sake of virtue nor do you need to take away another another person's good for your own good. Yeah. Now, this is where I want to um, segue into one of my favorite. Uh, well, OK, <laughs> I've heard a lot of good things about, about Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, the author of the Kuzari. Uh, unfortunately, I have not learned it much, but I want to go into one of his ideas. OK, and, th and this idea is his explanation of Gamzu Latova. So Gamzu Latova is a statement that people quote a lot. It means, OK, people mistranslate it as everything is for the best, or this is for the best. That's not what it means. It means this too is for the good, okay? Uh, good is different than best. Um, and um, if you look at the Gemara about the person who to whom this statement is attributed, Nakam Gamzu, the Gemara is not going to square very easily with what the Kuzri is going to write, okay? But uh, so we'll, we're going to leave aside the Gemara, and I, I just want to get what, what the Rubi Huda Halevi writes in the Kuzri, okay? And this is in... Um, uh, in... 311, and I'm using the Kafich translation uh, from the Judeo-Arabic, which I translated uh, into English. Uh, so I'm just going to read the English here. 
Actually, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the Hebrew. So uh, this is in the middle of a, of a thought. V'yashrish belibo tzidu kadin. A person should deeply root in his heart the tzidu kadin. Now, tzidu kadin is a very loaded term, okay? Tzidu kadin, when, when I, I, I'll ask you guys, do you, do you envision, or if you have aphantasia, do you associate to um, a particular, I guess, event when you hear the term tzidu kadin? I can think of two possible answers that that uh, that I think are probably the most common. Or maybe you're not familiar with the term. So tzidukadin is, um, it usually refers to when a person, um, on a personal level, like tzidukadin is when you, when you, when someone close to you dies. And that's what it says in the Siddur when it says, when you say the, the bracha of bracha atashem lakim lakalam dayana ms. They call it tzidukadin, where you are, you know, basically like, acknowledging the righteousness and God's judgment, you know, and on a global level, Tzidka Din has to do with how we relate to uh, things like the Holocaust, you know, or the, the fancy word for it is theodicy, is the question of like, you know, evil in the world and how we reconcile that with God's goodness and justice. Okay, so, so this is, this is going to be his statement on Tzidka Din, or one of his statements, he says, one should deeply root in his heart Tzidka Din, the vindication of divine judgment, um, min oros hanegishos uh, so that it becomes a shield and protection for him from the events and tribulations that occur in the world. Uh, when a person deeply roots in his heart the righteousness of the creator of living beings, who sustains and manages them in wisdom, even though the particulars are beyond your comprehension, but you can get a general a general appreciation of them. Um, I'm actually going to switch to reading this in English just to prevent it from getting a, a fraction. So um, uh, one can nevertheless appreciate the generalities of the system by observing the perfection of the creation in living beings. This this appreciation comes from observing the wonders and exceptional phenomena that point to the intentionality of he who is wise, desirous, omniscient, and omnipotent. This perfection is manifest in the fact that he, God, gave all creatures from the most delicate to the most coarse everything they need, including internal and external senses and organs, and provided suitable and fitting instruments for the, to these organisms. For example, he equipped rabbits and deer with the means to flee and the trait of timidity, but he endowed predators with the traits of aggression and tools for attacking and preying. When one contemplates the creation of the organs, their benefits, and their relationship with these organisms, one will see in this the righteousness and wise design, leaving no doubt or hesitation in one's mind about the righteousness of the creator. And if the deceptive imagination interferes to attribute injustice to God, because rabbits are prey for predators and flies for spiders, in other words, if you look at a rabbit getting devoured and you say, how could God let that happen? You know, that's unjust. Um then rationality will rebuke it, saying, how can I attribute injustice to the wise one whose righteousness is already clear to me and who has no need to commit injustice? If the hunting of predators for rabbits and the hunting of spiders for flies were accidental, I might claim randomness. However, I see that the wise and just ruler is the one who prepared hunting tools for the lion, such as aggression, strength, claws, and teeth, and he made the spider with a sense of cunning and the ability to weave webs without learning, weaving nets, and provided the appropriate tools for this craft. He prepared flies as sustenance and food for it, just as he prepared many fish for the food of other fish. Should I then say, should I then say that this is not the wisdom, that this is not wisdom beyond my comprehension, and should I not entrust it to the one who called, uh, the one called uh, the rock whose work is perfect. That's Hatsur Tamim Paolo. Okay. Um, so just pausing for a second. So what argument is he making so far here? Like if you had to summarize his his main point so far. So what I see him saying is he's saying Tziduka Din in order to, you know, people look, people have problems with divine justice, right? Like he says that um, people have doubts and hesitations about the righteousness of the creator. Well, if you are preoccupied with your, um, you know, your particular uh, injustice that you're claiming that happened to you. So then, yeah, you're going to, you're going to view God as, uh, as unjust. But if you look around at all other living things, you'll see that everything functions perfectly, that God provides each creature with what it needs and everything exists in 
the circle of life, you know, in, in a perfectly balanced way. And the, um, you know, all the, you know, every creature has the tools and traits that it needs in order to survive and thrive. And, you know, he didn't have the word or conception of ecosystems, but the ecosystems remain in balance. Um, and I'm reminded of the Rambam here um, in the Morning Book of 312, where he says, we, so he's talking about people who, who view the universe as bad. And he says, the whole cause of this error is that this boor and his vulgar ilk uh, see all the world from the standpoint of the human individual. Every ignoramus fancies that the world exists just for him, as if nothing else existed. If things do not go his way, then he is sure that everything is bad. But if one considered the world in full and had any idea how tiny a part he plays in it, the truth would be obvious and he would see it clearly. Those who rave on about the world's ills do not carry on so about the angels, spheres and stars, or the elements and compounds, minerals, plants, and other animals. They dwell on certain human cases, aghast if someone eats spoiled food and contracts leprosy. How could such a thing be? Such a disaster. They are dismayed when someone goes blind from sexual excess, thinking blindness simply too dreadful, and so in other cases. Um, uh, and then I'll just do a warmer paragraph here. Uh, Truth be told, no human being, let alone any animal, is worth a thing alongside the world's ongoing existence. As it says clearly, man is like a puff of air. Man is a worm, a human being, a maggot. How then can the denizens and houses of clay? Lo, nations are as a drop in a bucket. So these are all looking. These and all the other scriptural texts to that effect have a sublime and weighty purpose to teach us our true worth. Lest one presume that the world exists for him alone. The world we hold exists at the creator's pleasure. Uh, meaning will. The whole human race is a trifle besides the celestial world of the spheres and the stars. With the angels, mankind simply does not compare. Man is just what rises highest in this lower world of ours, the noblest compound of the, of the elements. Uh, still, our existence is a great boon to us, imparted by God's grace, considering the special gifts with which we are favored. Um, okay, and he goes on. But in other words, the, the mistake people make is they 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 are very quick to cry injustice, uh, you know, to accuse God of injustice because they look at everything based on what happened to them. But if you look everywhere else in nature, everything is functioning smoothly. And what the Kuzuri is saying, or what Rabbi Huda Levi is saying, which he hasn't gotten to his final paragraph yet, is this is the key to Tzidu Kadin to vindicating divine judgment. Yeah, Rachel? Mm, I feel like this is sort of what I was going to ask before, and I maybe I'm just getting confused by it. Are these two separate points of like, an attitude that if something happens to you, you feel more comforted by the fact that you're part of a rational system, like a rational creator, separate from the point of like, if something happens to you, you're part of a whole. So like, it's, it's what's better uh, for the whole is more important. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, I will comment on that uh, after uh, we do the last paragraph, because I think that'll, that'll be uh, set us up better. Okay. Last paragraph. And one who deeply roots this idea in his heart, oops, sorry, that is not, oh, oh no, which was my translation. I think this is my translation. And one who deeply roots this idea in his heart will become someone like Nakam Ish Gamzu, who said about everything event that befell him, Gamzu Latova, this too is for the good. Then he will live a pleasant life always and sorrows will be light to him. Uh, perhaps he will even rejoice in them when he reflects on the sin he had and is now purified from, like someone who has paid his debt and is happy to have lightened his bur burden. He will rejoice in what he remembers and in the reward stored for him. Uh, he will rejoice in what he acquires for people through self-improvement, for hope and devotion to Hashem, may he be exalted. He will rejoice in the praise and glory that comes from it, both in his personal refinement and in the general refinement. If thoughts of imagination arise in his heart by the link of the exile, the dispersal of the nation, and the suffering and humiliation that have befallen it, he should first find comfort in the Tidduk Adin, as I have said, and then in the scouring of iniquities, um, and then from the memory and expected reward in the world to come, uh, and the connection to this divine, to the divine in this world. Uh, for okay, I, I think this is a conclusion more from his full uh, paragraph here. So what he's saying, uh, my understanding, and this I'm going to try and answer Rachel's question here, is okay. I think there's there's two mistakes. One is an intellectual mistake, and the other is an emotional mistake. Maybe there's more than that, but the intellectual mistake is when something bad happens to you, and you feel, or you think, I should say, you conclude maybe the world is not just. And what he's saying is he's saying, no, the, the cure for that illness is look around you and look at all the places in nature where everything functions perfectly. Um, and and then tell me, is this the work of a, a just God who provides for all of his creatures? Okay, now this is only in Hashgacha Klawas even. This is in general providence. And we hold by Hashgacha Pratis, which is even a greater benefit that God did to us. So without even getting into Hashgacha Pratis, you can be convinced of God's righteousness in providing for all of his creatures. And do you have a question here? Yeah, there's a question here. 
but are you really going to say that that well, this one particular doesn't work out according to my under, understanding of justice, so the entire system is unjust. That's not a rational uh, conclusion. You know, uh, example that I, I give uh, in this area is like if you took Isaac Newton uh, and you uh, you put him in a time machine and you uh, took him to 2024, and uh, and you know the first thing he would say is how do time machines work, but then the second thing he would say is when he would see a, a plane flying in the sky, you know he would momentarily think to himself, oh, that seems like an, uh, an exception to my, my, uh, you know, my law of gravity, you know, but would he throw out all of science? No, he would say, okay, I don't understand how this works right now, but I know everything else in nature that I've studied that physics is real and physics works. So there's a question I have and I have to like answer that, but, but he, it's not going to lead him to doubt the entire integrity of the, of the system. So saying that's, that's really what he's saying that how Tzidika Din works. And he's saying, that you could look at this in the animal kingdom. You could also look at it in the world of physics, but I think physics is beyond people's uh, reach. But animals we we see every day, you know. But then the second thing is what Rachel mentioned, which is that even if you know you uh, you have this point in mind intellectually, it can still feel bad that something bad is happening to you. And I think there is a comfort in the fact that you are part of the whole and that, you know, the, the system has, uh, did he use this term? No, uh, Marcus really has used the term um, that, uh, you know, uh, where is it? Um, what preserves the whole is the changing of the compounds no less than the changing of the physical elements. Um, so I, I think what he means by that is that, you know, we're in a physical world and the physical world that we live in involves things coming into being and passing away, you know, and cycles of stuff. And, you know, cells die. Okay, that's what happens. And cells also mutate. The dying of cells and the mutation of cells is going to result in things that are bad for particular people. But it is also re what results in all of life. You could not have life and you couldn't have a variety of life if cells did not grow and, you know, and, and duplicate with random mutations. Um, so, being part of the whole and realizing that, oh, like, you know, I am, you know, there, there, there's going to be a bell curve in terms of statistics. Again, I'm not, I'm not, I would never say this to someone who's going through a personal tragedy. We have to prepare for this before we go through a personal tragedy. Um, but, you know, people get diseases, people get sicknesses, and this is all good for the whole. And he, what he's saying is someone who's on a high level, like Nakamish Gamzu, will, will say, yeah, I'm part of God's world. And part of God's world involves all of these phenomena and and you know like there's a puzzle Mishle that says um uh ashiv rash nifgashu ose kulam hashem i think that's what the puzzle is is the poor man and the rich man meet hashem made all of them and i think what we said in the, in the when we did a share on that is you know the, the world is such where there are inequalities there are always going to be people who are richer and poorer relative to each other and there cannot be a world in which there is not that, you know, and God provides for those poor people by commanding everyone in tzedakah, you know, but there still will be people who are are relatively uh, poor and people who are relatively rich. And so if you accept the fact that this is the way the world works, you'll be like, OK, I was assigned the part of a poor person in this time of my life, you know, uh, and that's part of the overall good in the world. And I'll, I'll just read this excerpt from the Ramam but before I, I, I pause for questions. Um the Rambam in the Morning of Bukham 3.10, two chapters before where I was reading, talks about this, and he says, similar to Marcus Aurelius, we know then of a certainty that evil is not properly ascribed to God, not as a matter of primary intention, that is unsound. All his acts are pure good, for he produces only being, and all being is good. All evils are privations, again, there's a, there's a context here, so I'm not going into the context, uh, and all assigned causes only... And our assigned causes only in the sense I explained of God's giving matter the nature that it has, which is always linked to privation, as we've seen, by making matter the root of all ill and decay. Uh, uh, so whatever God gave no such matter is incorruptible and untouched by ill, meaning like the angels are not matter, and so they cannot be harmed. All God's real work then is good, for it is being. Therefore does the book that lit up the world's darkness say, God saw all that he had made, and lo, it was very good. Even the existence of this matter here below, linked to non-being and thus to death and all other ills, is good. For it sustains becoming and the world's permanence through the succession of one thing by another. This is why Rabbi Meir glossed, uh, he ne tov ma'od, behold, it was very good, as tov maves, death is good, uh, in the sense that I noted. So in other words, God created a universe with matter. Matter 
uh, is always going to result in these cycles of coming to be and passing away and of, of you know, corruption and decay and, you know, degeneration. And that's going to result in things that are bad for the particulars. But the good of the universe as a whole cannot be had without that quality. So in that sense, even death is good because it's part of the goodness of the entire world. And I think there's, there is comfort in that, for, again, for someone who's on a high level, that like, you know, I am, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, right now I'm on the, the, uh, the, you know, I guess the, 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 the downside of that cycle, or I, I am one of the, you know, the, people have to get sick, you know, viruses and bacteria are, uh, you know, are, are, uh, are creations of God as well. And, and God gave us an immune system to, to fight those, but like, there will be, for the sake of the entire balance, there will be uh, cases in which individuals will suffer as uh, as a result of illnesses, and it's all part of God's world, which is good as, as a whole. And again, this is purely talking about the Hashgacha Klalis, general providence. Hashgacha Pratis of, 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 you know, why am I not saved from this is a separate question, but but you have to tackle this first question first, and this is like, you know, the, uh, I her first heard this ascribed to um, uh, Neil Blonde when he got cancer, um, which he eventually died from, uh, when someone said, don't you ever ask, you know, why me? And he said, why not me? You know, and that has to be the first place our mind goes. Like, why would you assume that you're a physical being who's immune to physical diseases? You know, um, and again, on a higher level, a person could be comforted by that. Okay, that was a lot. A little overview of Eov there. But uh, any uh, any questions on, on, uh, on these points? Okay, I think this is what he means now. Now let's read this and, and see what he means. What is good for every part of nature is what is supplied by the nature of the whole and what preserves the whole. So that's exactly the idea that we were saying in the Kuzari, that and, and, and Breshis, Tov Ma'o, that God provides for all of his creatures and what's good for every part is provided by, by providence, by God. And that's what preserves the whole. And part of the preservation of the whole is the changing of compounds, no less than the changing of physical elements. I don't know what he means by the changing of physical elements, but I'd say that the closest corollary is, you know, we hold that everything in the universe breaks down, right? So physical elements break down and become other elements. And that's just a part of how matter is designed. It's just property of matter. So in the same way that matter must undergo change, you know, the, the basic elements of the universe undergo change. So too, um, particular things that are made of matter, compounds, also undergo change, and you can't get mad at change. That's the nature of the universe, um, and it's part of the good of the entire whole. And this, excuse me, Isaiah, is I think the answer to your question. Be content with these doctrines. Make them your constant guiding principles. Get over your thirst for books so that you don't die grumbling. So what do you think he means there in light of everything we've said? Question for anyone. Yeah, tomorrow. Uh, I don't know about the books exactly, but I think the idea is that these are doctrines that if you think about them, then you will be content. Okay, yeah, exactly, right. And I, in fact, I think the Kuzri said this exactly. He said, um, you know, think of, do Tzidka Din and think about how God sustains and manages them in his wisdom. Though the particulars are beyond one's comprehension, one can nevertheless appreciate the generalities of the system by observing the, per, the perfection of the creation and living beings. So in other words, if you make your... So the, okay, we will never understand all the particulars of nature. So if you make your contentedness or your view of providence contingent on understanding every particular, then you're setting yourself up for a life of complaining and grumbling. You'll die grumbling. But if you say, no, vine tov ma'od, the universe is that God created is good. And, you know, hatsur tamim polo ki holderachav mishpat. God is the rock and, and all of his ways are um, hatsur tamim polo. His, his, his creation is perfect um, and all of his ways are justice. You know, you make that your guiding principle. And, um, Gamzu Latova and you make these general principles your guiding principles, that itself will allow you to go through life content. And is does that mean you should stop learning? No, it doesn't mean you should stop learning. And remember, he he's saying get over your thirst for books um for two, you know, first of all, because he didn't have his books, but also I think he's saying get over this this feeling that like you need to answer this particular question 
in order to be able to have contentedness in general and to have this view of God and providence in general. That would be a mistake. Yeah, Isaiah? So I'm wondering, do you think you could kind of like replace the first few sentences with the Yogomo Ikarim and then like go from there? The first like, would that be of uh, like, providence? Like meaning, yeah. Like he's kind of giving you, saying like you need to have certain certain ideas which are like guiding principles for life and once you're set with them then you can like go from there maybe maybe these ideas are specific because they're answering certain questions you might have so maybe what i was saying doesn't make sense but yeah i mean um, the, the the maneuver is correct about the yugamu ikarim but i think that's way too broad for what he's describing um because the yugamu ikarim are more for setting yourself up for a life of successful truth seeking you know uh this is really more about how to um I guess, relate to your fate and to what happens to you. Um, and yeah, you can really crime ultimately are going to be necessary for that. But I, I don't even know if that's true. I don't know if all the, you know, uh, it seems like Avram Avinu got along pretty fine without knowing about Mashiach, you know? Um, so I, I wouldn't go, if, if you're going to say the Yudgum will anything, I say the Yudgum will maybe. Um, but maybe. Um, but that'd be closer to what he's saying here. Yeah. Um, and so I think now we can even answer the last part. So be content with these doctrines, make them your gu constant guiding principles, get over your thirst for books so you don't die grumbling, but with true serenity and with heartfelt gratitude to God. Now, again, I, I think, I, I don't exactly know what his view of God is, but assuming that he views that God is the source of everything he just described, then you are, he would be thankful to God in the sense that it's not due to Marcus Aurelius that he has all this good. It's due to the the provider of, you know, the providential overseer of the universe who has this. And we can have that as well. Uh, you know, we even, again, obviously we hold by Hashgaka Pratis, we hold by individual providence. But even without that, there's so much to be grateful for in the way that Hashem set up the universe, um, that everything is functioning in line with justice and he provides for every uh for every creature and all the good is out there and uh and and keeping that at the forefront of our mind will keep us in this mode of gratitude you know for the good and also serenity of not being disturbed by the bad things that happen that's the gums of latova attitude so i think we've answered our questions yeah tomorrow it's just an association of i was reminded of the sure you gave on this at home uh you know which one i'm talking about um, it was it was one of the first ones you explained about how if you understand the systems of nature, you're not going to be disturbed by a Russia appearance. Yeah, I, so I think it was Mizra Shalia Um uh yeah, that's for spoiler alert for anyone who wants to know Mizra Shalia Mashabas. Um this is the uh that's my theory on, on uh, actually this is the wrong file, hold on. Um Tehillin ninety two. Oh, okay, fine. I, I, I'll just highlight it. Um, so this is the starter parak. I think this is the easiest parak to learn to heal him from. In Mizmer Shalim Mashabas, it splits evenly into two halves with a hinge. So the first half is, um, it is good to thank Hashem and to sing to your name, O exalted one, to recount your kindness in the morning, your faithfulness in the nights, upon a ten-string instrument and upon lyre with singing accompanied by harp. For you have gladdened me, Hashem, with your actions. About your handiwork, I will sing gloriously. How great are your works, Hashem? How very deep are your thoughts? So that's uh, according to the Radak and others, that is about David Melch recognizing the Chachma in creation, because this is Mizrash Elohim Shabbos, it's about Shabbos Day, which is focusing on creation, and that's your actions and your work. Uh, the Radak even says, I will sing joyously in, this, in the first person, singular, because uh, it takes a Chacham to recognize this. Okay, then you have sentence, uh, puzzle number seven, a boorish man doesn't know and a fool doesn't understand this. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. And then the, the last half is when the wicked bloom like grass and all the doers of iniquity blossom, it is to destroy them forever and ever. But you, God, remain exalted forever, Hashem. For behold, your enemies, Hashem, for behold, your enemies shall perish. Dispersed shall be all doers of iniquity. You raise like a re'em in my pride. I was saturated with fresh oil. My eyes have seen my foes. When those who would harm me rise up, and uh, my ears have heard. A righteous person will flourish like a date palm and like a cedar in Lebanon who will grow tall. Planted in the house of Hashem, in the courtyards of our God, they will flourish. They will still be fruitful in old age, vigorous and fresh they will be. To tell that Hashem is upright in my rock in whom there's no injustice. So the second half is about uh, how the Rishayim will, the, the, the evildoers will ultimately uh, fail and the, the, the tzaddikim, the righteous will flourish. So my, the way I learned this is that Pasuk number seven is the hinge that could relate to both halves. A boorish man doesn't know and a fool doesn't understand this. 
meaning a Bush man and a fool uh, doesn't know and a fool doesn't understand what we said before, which is the Chachm and the creation. And because he doesn't understand that, he also won't understand how to make sense of when wicked people seem to be succeeding and, and uh, righteous people seem to be failing. And the key here is to realize that to the extent that you appreciate the Chachma of Hashem in nature and that all the systems are good, you will have conviction and certainty that there is a system in human affairs as well, even if you can't understand the particulars and if it seems like things are happening that are unjust right now. Is that the idea you're referring to, tomorrow? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this idea uh, uh, appears throughout Tehillim. I just think that uh, that uh, uh, Tehillim 92 is, uh, is a really, really good and familiar example of that. Yeah. Okay. So let's just quickly go back to our parak and then just see if we answered all of our questions, at least in a general way. Um, so question one, what is providence? What is fortune? And what's their interrelationship? So we did address that, um, that providence is the rationality in the universe. Fortune is either randomness or capriciousness of deities. Okay. And he's saying, what's the relationship? Is there is no fortune. It's all providence. What's the Havamina? So we, I think we talked through each of those. Um, What's the main idea? How do these arguments contribute to the main idea? And what's the flow? So the main idea is that you should keep your eye on the ball, and the ball is uh, providence, is that everything is uh, arranged uh, and operates in a rational and beneficial way for everyone, um, and nothing escapes that, and there are, are, is no source of the good other than that, and all of the necessary good is provided for. Um, and if you keep this in mind, you will be content and serene and gracious, and have gratitude. Um, and uh, what is his view of the good and his relationship with the universe as a whole? So we, we answer that, as I just said. Uh, what is he saying at the end? Uh, is he saying that you should just be content with these doctrines? Um, and how do you do that? Uh, Isaiah has two questions. So I, I think what he's saying is that there is a certain universal principle which everyone can get. Again, the ones we listed here are the whole universe that God created is very good. Um, um, that that God is the rock whose work is perfect and all of his ways are justice. Uh, God opens his hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. You know, there's many of these statements throughout Torah that and, and Tanakh that say this. And these principles, you should have focus on those principles and see how supported they are from all the evidence around you. Even when you have particular questions, don't make your acceptance of those general principles contingent on answering particular questions. That type of thirst for books is bad, meaning you should always thirst for books to seek more knowledge, but not to the point where you can't be content and gracious uh, and, and have conviction in those main principles. And if you do this, then you'll have gratitude and serenity, which is uh, our questions about the end. Uh, and the practical decision ta uh, making takeaway here is that, um, you know, focus on the big picture uh, and the accurate big picture, um, uh, and that will eliminate a lot of discontent um, and probably a lot of bad decisions. I mean, I don't think he's going to particular decision making here, but you could see how if a person, you know, um, embraced an idea that the universe has forces other than rational providence, that could lead to really bad decision making. But I don't think that that's the point here. I think the point here is how to deal with complaining um, and, uh, and, and how to be content. Um, and that's practical enough for me. Uh, and uh, and in terms of our overall uh, endeavor here with the whole intro here, I think this is an example of something where even though Marcus Aurelius is working with a different idea of providence and God, I think it aligns very well with our idea, as I hope I've demonstrated. Um, and uh, I think we can we can uh, you know employ this teaching in our own lives and uh, not risk getting uh, you know horrendously bad um, you know heretical ideas. Okay, any questions or comments? Okay, that was the smoothest of the shirim. <laughs> we uh, really, uh, really uh, mined this and uh, got an idea. So happy about how, how it turned out. Okay, Lee Netter, we'll continue next week. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.